Good afternoon. Welcome to the fall series of 2012 for the UT Energy Symposium. As with the la previous semesters, we have a great list of speakers lined up for this semester. Uh, for those of you who are attending this for the first time, UT Energy Symposium brings in experts in energy from the industry, academia, uh, the government to talk about very broad, important uh, global energy issues. This is also, for the students in the room, this is also a course, so you could take it for one credit. If you need more information, you can talk to me after the class. Or Eric, do you mind uh, raising your hand? You could also talk to Eric. Or feel free to send us emails, and we'll let you know how to register for this course. There is also a mailing list. If you want to get on that list, again, please contact us. The speaker next week, which is 6th of September, it's not one speaker, it's actually a set of speakers, because we have what we have every semester called the Student Research Showcase, where we bring in three or four UT masters or PhD students to tell us about their cutting edge research. The idea is to provide them with a platform to talk about their research, but also the hope is that it will catalyze broader interest among the student community in, uh, in uh, research uh, in energy issues. Uh, that, it gives me Tremendous pleasure to introduce our speaker today, a colleague here, uh, Professor Matt Fakus. Matt is an assistant professor this, in the School of Architecture here, and he's also principal of his own firm, which is MF Architecture, which is based here in Austin. Matt holds a Master of Architecture from Harvard University's Graduate School of Design. He's director of UT Austin's Thermal Lab, which, which you should really go to his website and visit. It's just remarkable in, in the type of uh, building research and sustainable architecture research he's leading uh, at the Thermal Lab there. Uh, in his professional career, he, he has worked with several, several top design firms and, and prize-winning uh, academics and architects. And through his career, he has, you know, I, I really found it interesting. He has worked on a wide range of large-scale international projects, including a new Smithsonian Museum in DC, a residential skyscraper in Northeast London, and a series of high-speed rail, rail uh, stations in Saudi Arabia. His design research and writings have been published widely, and he, he was also interviewed last year by the National Public Radio, NPR, on the future of sustainable architecture, and that, that was featured on On Point with Tom Hashbrook, which many of you probably know, also in July last year. So with that, I welcome Matt. Thank you. First, thanks for having me. It's really, it's really a treat to be here. Um, I, I will say as a caveat, first, I, I wouldn't consider myself a legitimate expert in energy, so to speak, but I, but I, I am decidedly an architect. But I, I, know what, I know what I don't know, and I, and I have worked with engineers quite a lot. And that's, uh, in full disclosure, part of my position here, part of why I was recruited to come to UT, was uh, part of a cluster hire position where I am decidedly a professor of architecture, but I'm meant to help bridge the gap between the School of Architecture and, and uh, the various schools of engineering. One of the ways I, I do that, uh, I'll throw in a shameless plug here in the beginning, is, is a class that I teach that's interdisciplinary for both architects and engineers and, and other, uh, other walks as well, where we talk about uh, light and sustainable design. And this varies from daylighting to artificial lighting and from the very technical end of thermal exchange and those impact to the very phenomenological and sensorial aspect, talking about film and the, and the arts and such. So this class is taught on Wednesday evenings, and I, I still am looking to recruit a few more engineering students uh, for this course. So you, you, you would have only missed the one course, which is similar to my lecture tonight in Nature. So you would be, you would be uh, excused from missing that first course, and, and you're welcome to email me if you would like to join the course. I'll mention this one last time at the very end, but uh, enough of that. Um, I, I want to start off this lecture by talking about a very broad arc of architecture, a very broad trajectory. And you know, we're, we're, at, we're at, a, at, a, at a critical impasse right now in architecture and engineering uh, due to the current energy crisis, where we really need to rethink the way that things have traditionally been, been done and my argument is the primary, the primary way to go about that is integration from the very beginning of any design process. And so the, the traditional model of an architect having a, having a design go all the way to construction documents and then 
at, at about that point, bringing on engineers, that doesn't work anymore, particularly for very large buildings with complex systems. And so, you know, I, I want to talk a bit about uh, you know, where, where I think we're going where in, in architecture. So, you know, in, in the Renaissance, 500 years ago, in classicism, uh, symmetry was a standard, and the, the form, essentially form was more important than function. So, this is obviously, this is uh, Palladio's Villa Rotunda, but whether or not this house actually needed four porches that were identical and, and four rooms around the perimeter that were all identical, four foyers, that didn't matter. The form was more important. And so, uh, th and that was, that was a standard for quite a long time. Neoclassicism, neoclassicism found its way into the U.S. very clearly um, well up to, up to 100 years ago or so when modernism began to challenge that. And so modernism's premise was that now function is more important than form and asymmetry was standard because necess almost necessarily there would never be a project where you would have an absolute, absolute symmetry, and absolute order uh, purely driven by function. Instead, uh, in the case of the Savoie House by Le Corbusier, uh, he parsed it out into servant and serve spaces. So you had the service spaces, the bathrooms, the closets, those types of spaces, consolidated all in one area to allow to open up other uh, more common living, area, living areas. Now I argue that where, where we're going um, is that we're, we're moving away where neither form nor function uh, are the driving principle. But, uh, and, and there actually is no formal standard, but that actually light and energy trump energy and, and I'm sorry, light and energy trump function and form. And wh what I mean by that is, is that in, in some ways, ironically, I'm suggesting that we're almost going backwards to pre-Renaissance. We're going back uh, to some vernacular strategies. So in addition to high-tech strategies, we're also going to go back to vernacular strategies of thinking of ways that we can could, we could live uh, based on the climates around us. Uh, since, as we know, the past 100 years or so, since we've been able to control climates artificially, that's radically changed the capacity of what architecture has become. So, uh, as, as was mentioned in the introduction, I, I worked for uh, Foster and Partners in London for uh, almost five years before coming here. And uh, the, uh, that, that profoundly, it profoundly influenced me. That this, it's a firm that does very large-scale large projects. And I got to work very, quite directly with Norman Foster um, on, on a few projects, which, to be honest, was not a very easy endeavor. It's very, uh, but but I, I, learned, I learned a ton in the process. And the, the firm, as, as most of you are probably aware, has done um, such projects as the, the Beijing airport, which is done for the Olympics and is the, the largest floor plate in the world, the Berlin Reichstag, uh, the Swiss rebuilding, which I'll reference today, the British Library, uh, so on and so forth. So they're very large-scale projects, and all of them very concerned about the human experience and energy performance, very concerned about the light and material and, and the way that a building functions, as well as optimizing performance. These are just some shots of Norman shooting down one of my ideas, <laughs> probably <laughs> <laughs> laughing at my ideas. Uh, I, I want to point out that uh, when Norman was about my age, he collaborated with Buckminster Fuller. And that was a very pivotal thing in, that happened in his career. Uh, and so uh, I, 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 in some ways, I think of Buckminster Fuller as my professional grandfather. And, and, and I, I feel as though I'm influenced by a lineage of thinking, all of which has to do with thinking uh, going back to basics and thinking about uh, ways that we can build the, the very intelligently and, and ways to think about the human plight, to think, to think about trying to provide good buildings for, for everyone. Uh, one, of, one of the early projects that uh, Norman and Bucky collaborated on was this uh, climatrophis, which is a, a bit in line with... I, actually, let, let me... Sorry, let me as a caveat before that, first say that uh, in, in regards to what I was saying before about the importance of integration, uh, this is a quote from Bucky Fuller, and I, I don't like it when people read from the screen, but I'm going to do it for this. Um, Society is highly specialized. Specialists don't ever see what is going on in the next laboratory, so there is very little integration of the information accruing to the doing of less with more. And so this was more than half a century ago, and, and Bucky was already concerned about that. And I think it's only gone even further that direction. Both in the fields of architecture and engineering have become so specialized. And it's important to have, to, to develop those special uh, specializations, but not to, at the expense of not understanding the bigger picture of how, how it's all interrelated. So one of, one of Bucky's, uh, some, many, many of his proposals were ridiculous or quite absurd. Uh, th this one, for example, was you know, just proposing this uh, 
controlled environment, this big dome over uh, midtown Manhattan. And uh, well, it, it does seem absurd, but it did happen in The Simpsons. It, 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 has, it has happened. It's a very effective way of containing a city. Um, but in, in, in uh, coming back to seriousness, the, the, these early projects that Bucky and Norman collaborated on uh, in around 1970 were very influential, and, and not immediately in, in, in Norman Foster's career, but a bit later, uh, particularly with the Berlin Free Library where there was a distinct departure from the, the typological assumption or the tectonic assumption that uh, all floor plates would, re, would uh, meet the building skin. And so the building skin would really just be uh, almost a, a wrapper around the given, the given floor plates. And, and, and this, uh, now due to structural innovation partially, uh, the idea is that if, if you separate the building skin, the building envelope, from the floor plates, then you uh, allow for uh, a, a, uh, two things to happen. One is that you, you, you free up the floor plates and you allow for any uh, floor, floor, floor plan configuration, which comes back to what I was saying before about uh, instead of architecture being driven by function, it, it will be driven more by uh, climate performance or energy performance. Since buildings over time often change function quite radically to make something that's so tightly fit, if it's not loose fit enough, that it, it often can't live on if it needs to change function. So it does that, but it also allows for an opportunity to use that envelope to actually manage uh, light and temperature. So this was an, an early sketch showing the, those floor plates. And so again, this is a library. And, and most libraries that I've ever been to have really dark and dismal stacks of books. And it's, some, it's a place where you'd never want to spend time. And even the reading spaces aren't usually that great. So the idea here was by pulling these floor plates away. And so we're looking now, we're looking down, and you can see the, the floor plate below undulating. You allow light to trickle in deep into the stacks and all around the, the, the various reading areas. So performatively, it allows for uh, quite an enjoyable space, this being an, an, an exonometric drawing uh, showing the, the same effect. But, but again, you can see how the stacks actually get a, a, a bit more um, light coming in. And then also, um, again, this is something that couldn't have happened more than 100 years ago, having this uh, radial uh, steel truss structure, which enabled this envelope to happen. And, and this, this is a, well, a series of the floor plans and also a, a construction progress uh, shot. Here you can see the, fl the floor plates poured the actual piece there, which, you know, it, to be critical, uh, it's, it's it looks as though a UFO has landed in, in this campus uh, in, in Germany, but that was part of the design intent, was that this actually is a historic <coughs> building surrounding this. This building was meant to be designed within the courtyard and the design intent was instead of trying to mimic or mock what was there to do something that is completely different and then comes down to two snouts on either end to connect to the existing buildings. So within the space, you can see how the, the reading rooms wrap around the stacks. And you have primarily diffuse light with the exception of a few uh, translucent windows to allow views of a passing cloud to, uh, going by. But, but it creates this uh, both in terms of light, but also there's a thermal story as well in terms of this, this active, active envelope, which uh, allows, uh, you can capture the heat when you want it, or you can exhaust the heat when you don't want it, essentially. And that was something that was an important part from the very beginning. Here you can see, uh, by the way, one of the, the transparent windows that are, that are mixed in. Uh, that was something that came in you know, very early on in a collaboration between architect and engineer. The, these are the types of things that were being discussed just as much as any other architectural feature would be discussed is, is thinking about the systems and the structure uh, in parallel with the space itself. And this is then showing the, the, the diagrammatically the way that the building performs uh, in, for, in terms of heat management at different temperature levels. So it ends up being an extremely, extremely high-tech building uh, that d decidedly couldn't, you know, had, you need a, a very uh, accomplished contractor and very accomplished consultants. But it really comes from a very simple idea, this very simple sketch, this very simple idea of, of pulling the floor plates away um, to allow for a, a new opportunity to, con to control the environment and, and, and or allow for modulation and, and change in the, in the environment, um, as well as uh, enhancing the performance of the actual program. So again, that, that form was something that was, certainly wasn't contextual, as you can tell. It was something that was driven by, uh, the, the, in that case, a little bit more by function, but primarily about uh, for, the, for the, the energy story. 
Now, coming into a more urban realm um, with uh, skyscrapers, one problem that happens is, is the consideration of wind and wind turbulence, particularly the entry of a building, but also just in general, the buildings need to, the taller a building is, the more difficult it is to resist lateral loads, such as wind. And so along those same lines of thinking, where this would be the typical configuration where you would expect that there would be turbulence down at the, the entry of the building, and then you'd also expect to have more pressure on, on each of the hard edges of that. This being a typical rectangular extruded uh, downtown building, a skyscraper. With the Swiss Re, the idea was, well, why, not just, why, why can't a building be aerodynamic? Uh, both for, uh, both, both, well, and, and, uh, there are several reasons that I'll get into in, in a moment. One of them being that the, the, this site in London at St. Mary Axe is, is a very tight site. There's not very much room to fit the program that the client wanted. And it's not too far away from St. Paul's Cathedral and the various few corridors. So there was a height limit of a, a little more than 40 stories. And, and the clients, in order to make it worthwhile, needed to really pack the site. And so one of the things that was done was by having that tapered form, it, by tapering down at the base, you're able to uh, still have necessary setbacks at the base to allow for the courtyards. But... Uh, but then swell out as, as you move up. So there's this, th that, that is a functional driver. The, the diagrid was something that is, is to do with, uh, you know, I, I assume that many of you are, are structural engineers or have uh, some experience in structural engineering and are very aware of diagrids. But very basically, uh, you, you remove all of the vertical columns and, and, and by, by moving the diagonal columns, you use 20% less structure in doing so. It takes more trigger work in terms of the construction, certainly. But that's, that's the intent. So, uh, so that, that was the idea for the actual uh, the, the diaphragm uh, wrapper of the building. And as for the candy cane stripes, there's a, a very important story to do with that as well, to do, to do with energy and light. So one of the thoughts is that by, uh, within each of those candy cane stripes, uh, there are operable windows that are, on, that are mechanically, mechanically operated that allow air to move up through the atria. And that wouldn't work so well in this climate, but it works quite well there, where the temperature is never too far off from room temperature. And so being able to actually manually or uh, yeah, partially manually exhaust the building. And then secondly, just being able to allow light deep into the slab. So when you think of a typical office, you have four corner offices. So the idea here is, well, now you have you know, three times as many corner offices, even though it's not a true corner, but you have an atrium to one side and a view out on the other side. And then the, 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 the actual swirling of the structure has to do with uh, creating that thermal, that, uh, yeah, the thermal flow through the actual structure. This was a, uh, obviously a, a model that was done in the office studying how the, the, the structure and the floor plates would actually work. Um, and then that, that was actually quite apparent um, in, the, in the construction process, not so much from this view, but more from this view. You can actually very clearly see the atria and how they... Uh, how they do correspond with the darker part of the, the candy cane. Darker structure. I probably shouldn't call it candy cane. I, 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 I've never heard anyone have a better name for that. But the, here's an example of the, the actuators actually having opened all of the, uh, the windows to allow the air to ripple through when, when the temperature is amenable for it. And this is then looking up and down a, a couple of the atria. And you get a sense of a bit of a sense of the scale of the, that diagrid structure in this particular view. So again, it's 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 it's, it's a it's a building not driven by looking at previous precedents and understanding what, what what's a typical skyscraper we've done. How do we just try to improve that typology? It's actually going back to first principles and thinking about what is a building, how does a building perform, how does it sit in its landscape, how does it breathe, how does it light itself, and so on and so forth. And so you, coming back to uh, energy and light as, a, as a, a very important driver in the design process. And it, it's become widely accepted. It, 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 to, to be honest, I don't, I, it, it doesn't see, you know, at, at first glance, I can imagine how one might not think it's that, that interesting. I think once you know a bit more of the story behind it, it, it has, has a, bit, a lot more merit. But the city has widely accepted it, and it's, it's all across pop culture in, uh, in the UK and in the world. So coming back to this something I touched on very briefly earlier within that spectrum of the architectural arc. Interestingly, before we had climate, the, po the possibility of climate control, uh, in indigenous cultures necessarily needed to be very intelligent about how they managed uh, light and heat. 
Uh, this is the, the Medina and Fez, Morocco, where there are 9,000 streets, no two parallel. And so it's obvious, obviously not master planned in the way that we think of master planning. But there's a very important logic that's used here, and it has to do with optimization of surface to, to optimize light and heat. So instead of having, so I've, I've, I've drawn these idealized versions of uh, the villa. If you imagine this just isolated, obviously there'd be a lot of solar exposure in this very hot climate if it were on its own. But the fact that, that, that most of them are touching each other, or if not touching each other, there's a very uh, small space between each other. Really, the only place that you're allowing light in is the aperture of the courtyard. Now, so, so, so first off, you're, you're limiting the amount of light that, that, that can um, enter. But secondly, to really make it work, since there was no uh, HVAC, uh, the, the strategy was to actually think of floor plans more loosely. And so the idea was that you would migrate through the house as the sun would move throughout the day. So instead of having a, a, a one, only one room where you would eat or one room where you would sleep, you would actually move throughout the space, essentially run the sun chasing you around the house, essentially. So this comes back to that argument that uh, energy and light are actually more important than any type of formal determinant of saying, I want a classical house or I want whatever. This is actually driven very much by uh, the climate concerns. Now, an example of uh, un unregulated development, in this case with just enough technology to get themselves in trouble, uh, the Kowloon Walled City was, is, is a very strange area in Hong Kong which actually uh, somehow slipped through the fingers, slipped, slipped through the grasp of British uh, rule and Hong Kong rule. And so there was no regulation for, for many years. And so instead of tapering away as, as, you would, as, as you're meant to do by uh, daylight, daylight codes where buildings are meant to taper up as they get taller, the buildings actually can to leave it further and further out until it became a seamless, somewhat of a seamless fabric across the top. And of course this is quite, uh, well this is, a, this is a, a sectional drawing here giving a bit of a sense of the absurdity of that where, where typically you would have uh, regulations of, of stepping back once you get above a certain level. Here, the streets get no natural light at all. And, and it's you know, been labeled a city of darkness and it led to uh, a lot of social stagnation and, and very, very big problems. Um, so it not, not only did it perform very poorly, also there's also no utility easements, for example. So you can see all of the wires hanging out and such. Uh, so that there, were, there were all different types of problems with this. So th there, there's this interesting, uh, there, there's, <laughs> this, this again was a, a bit of an interesting combination of something developing over time, but with just enough CMU and rebar to start to, to, to go unregulated and get in trouble. So there, there is a reason why we do have uh, these types of uh, codes. Uh, and and, and it, interestingly, when it comes to pop culture and film, this being Blade Runner, uh, I don't think there's ever, I don't think within a city, there's certainly no direct sunlight at all. It's, it's imagining this very dystopic future where uh, everything is extremely dark and uh, essentially man has choked himself away from all the natural elements, of, from, from nature in general. So there's this very dystopic view here where it's completely dark. But what if we think about the exact opposite? The exact opposite isn't much better. If we think about having, uh, in this being THX 1138, George Lucas's thesis project at USC, uh, where this was a, an, another version of the future where in, in this case uh, the way you would imprison someone was to, was to cast them away to this place where there's only light. There's, it's only just monotonous, diffuse light. There's no differentiation, no walls, no surfaces. You can walk as far as you want, but you're just in this endless realm of light. And so, so obviously going to the other extreme of the spectrum as well and just saying, well, just more and more light. Obviously there's a problem with that as well. So really... Uh, the reason we do have the, the codes that we have, and obviously, um, well, is, is to, to really try to modulate that and try to strike, strike a fine line between because there is no uh, perfect end. Uh, you know, either extreme is not, is not so good. So in, in that line of thinking, uh, a, a project that I'm not going to speak about too much here, but I want to reference in that regard is Mazdar City. Uh, which is designed by Foster and Partners. And this is a project that was a, 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 um, a net zero, uh, a carbon neutral city built from scratch, a, a one mile by one mile square, square mile, a one square mile city built from scratch, uh, which is obviously very difficult to do without, without it being uh, heavy handed. When, typically when things are built really quickly, they're obviously overly rigid and they don't allow for the sort of subtleties that you would hope to find in a city. The most interesting cities are usually cities that developed over many years 
and there have been different grids that have been overlaid over time when there's been different rule. And so those idiosyncrasies are what usually makes a city interesting. So here, they tried to accelerate that process a bit. Um, so the, the firm thought of, by one thing, investigating things such as the, the Medina and Fez and understanding uh, what works in the vernacular culture, but then algorithmically developing variety such, a, such that you would, once again, work off of this uh, typological precedent, this vernacular precedent of having the very narrow streets which allow a bit of modulated and dappled light to come through. Um, and, and then, of course, then bringing in high-tech elements as well, such as uh, actually PV panels are what are actually, on this one, the PV panels are what are actually providing the shading. So you're har harvesting energy and, and there's this, this whole, the whole city is built one level above a, a personal rapid transit system that happens below the ground. And this, is, this has been under construction for a few years now and is actually amazingly uh, I don't have photos with me today, but it has, it's, 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 it's amazingly progressing along. I, I can't believe how fast it's actually becoming a reality. But this comes back to the idea of if you are given a blank slate, what would you do? And, and you know, obviously, um, too much light and, and not enough light, either extreme, are obviously a problem. So this, this, this uh, design was very carefully trying to mitigate that and work within that uh, realm. So another project... Um, that I, that I worked on quite extensively. Um, it, it, it brought me to pose this question, where you know, how much of a difference can one designer really make in, in the big picture? I, I, I can understand how, and, and even myself, sometimes we, as, as we hear bad news about global warming and such, you can reach a point of, of despair where even as, as a designer, where ostensibly you would have an opportunity to make a difference, you can imagine that it, it becomes hard to think, well, is, is, how, how much difference can I really make? And in this case, it was, was, it was a project where I felt there was the opportunity to really make a difference. And so I'm going to read from the screen again. Stefan Bailing, who is a, a partner at Foster, Foster and Partners that I, um, when I was working there, uh, said, consumption is a matter of needs, and needs depend on, on design. Your need for gas depends upon the design of your car, and your need for a car, in turn, depends on how the city you live in is designed. So if you can change the design of your city, you can change your needs and in the end change your consumption. Now, this really hits home for me because I, I didn't own a car for the past eight years before I moved to, uh, to Austin. And that wasn't because I just decided I'm not going to own a car. It was, it, was, it, was, it was a function of the city I lived in. It was because I lived in London and lived for years and lived in Boston before that. And the infrastructure was there to allow me to easily do that. So it, it, it wasn't, it, it, so it, to me this seems very accurate that if, if a city is designed in a way to accommodate that, people, there is a tipping point where people will begin to do that. And it's a very controversial topic here with Cap Metro. Uh, but uh, but I, I, I think most people understand, and there are obviously a lot of political implications involved with that beyond just the infrastructural element. But uh, in, in this case, what we designed was uh, a series of rail stations between Mecca and Medina in Saudi Arabia, which essentially allows a more sustainable pilgrimage to Mecca with the incredible amount of people that go to Mecca every year and that are often go by uh, standard um, automobiles to now allow a, a high-speed rail option. And so in order to do this, it was a, a, a monumental task, uh, un understandably, to even just in terms of the feasibility and understanding and, uh, what, what the draw would be and how to phase this. And if you were to build just two stations first, which two would you build? Even, even very fundamental questions such as that. But one of the interesting, th interesting things that, that uh, came out of this for me was that we were teamed with 30 of us architects were in the same room. We brought Bureau ha 30 architects from Bureau Happold, sorry, 30 engineers from Bureau Happold into the room with us from day one or almost day one, maybe we got a little bit of a head start. We might have, we might have influenced it a little bit and, and said, okay, we're, this is what we're doing. But we, from, from the very beginning, I had 30, 30 architects and 30 engineers in the same room. I said, we're going to figure this out together. And, and we worked real time in BIM, uh, developing the scheme from, from the ground up. And that, and that profoundly affected me. And th th there were a lot of growing pains with that process, and there were, there were some difficulties with that. But it, it profoundly influenced the way I thought about design, the way I thought about the direction forward in design, and what I'd outlined in the very beginning as my, what I see as a trajectory of, of architecture. So uh, I'll, I'll speak just a little bit about um, the, the anatomy of this, this type of design. So there were, there were uh, so many logistical issues to, to contend with in terms of security and access and uh, it, in addition to uh, designing a very long span structure to accommodate that. 
so the structural grid was something that came, was a point of contention very early on in terms of determining, and of course the platforms drive the structural bays and the structural bays drive the, you know, the mezzanines and the concourse levels and it, it, everything is interrelated and that's, 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 that's the interesting part of using BIM is that you can't ignore that. When you're working in BIM you can't, you can't be working in a drawing that's floating off somewhere else in the world and, and be convinced that it's working. It, you, you, in, in BIM every, every decision you make shows up in someone else's drawing and you, you know very quickly if there are problems. So there, there was a bit of, uh, uh, for better words, gridlock in the beginning where we were trying to sort of find where we could actually um, find a middle ground to work with, uh, with the client's demands and with the, uh, between the architects and engineers. Uh, what we ended up with was a, was a modular structure and that was partially uh, based on the idea that we would use that same structural module for, for all four stations. We, we, we tried to find one that was hopefully the best common denominator that, that could then work in, in, um, in the different locations. But the, the, but the way they would be clad and the, the way the material would be fit out would be very highly customized to that specific site. So in, in, in along that thinking, uh, one of the investigations we had to do quite quickly was thinking about uh, if you, obviously if you have a roof, if you have you know, a, a, almost a, you know, half a million square feet uh, in a continu continuous roof, obviously you're gonna have skylights. If you wanna have any nat natural light at all, and so that was so thinking about those the, how the apertures for skylights would work was a was a very important issue and this is th something that is is very unique at, at Foster's, but uh, due to the fact that the firm has been around for 40 years and doing these projects for 40 years, there's an incredible uh, just background of knowledge for how to how to do these types of things. So for for any any type of any typology of project you can think of, whether you want to design a hotel or an airport, there have been 40 or 50 of them done by the firm before. And you can learn from which ones were more successful or less successful, and even within various climates. So in, in, in this particular case, in terms of our, day, our daylighting strategy and energy strategy, we were able to look at previous examples of, of uh, roof apertures and able to understand that between Stansted Airport in London, which has a 10% glazed roof, and uh, uh, Black Kok in uh, Hong Kong, and in Beijing, 6%, and Queen Alia, 7%. We were able to, to really, you know, we, we, we weren't blindly going into this. We, we knew more or less where we could start to begin to work with to operate from there. Uh, and these are just a, f a few other, well, this is some of the structural development, as you can see, a bit of the structural development along with uh, thinking about the, the lighting strategy. So as the building began to come together, as, as, we, as we began to coordinate all of these, the, the different entities of, of, of structure and cladding and and uh, function and systems. Uh, along with that, as, as a parallel work stream, was, was saying, all right, even if we agree that we want a 5% 5 of apertures in the roof, which was what we decided upon from, from our daylight studies, even the way you do that is there's infinite ways you could manage that. And so we went through a series of exercises based on all different types of strategies where we began to test many different types of things before finally arriving at a system of 5% that we thought uh, worked most appropriately. And so these are, are these structural steel trees that are 85 feet tall. Uh, again, uh, you know, span quite a, you know, understandably span quite a long distance, but also are all in line with every other uh, systematic requirement within, within the building. And another very important part of that is coordinating. So even though I said that uh, you wouldn't be able to get much daylight without having uh, any apertures in the roof, in full disclosure, the, the, the facades were a very critical element to resolve. And so there's a, a, multi, a polyvalent and multi-layered facade, uh, which also helped to modulate light, which went through a series of ex very rigorous exercises as well in terms of determining the, the right amount of light without having glare, too much glare, and so on and so forth. Now, to bring this back home a bit, um, when, I was, uh, when I came to UT, one of the things I've taken on is, is uh, being the director of the thermal lab, which is essentially a, a lab to test uh, facade technology, whether it be the glass and or shading devices and a combination thereof. And it, what they, uh, let's see, there are, there are two now, which I'll show in a moment, but what it essentially is is a highly insulated box with just one, uh, one, open, one opening, one facade facing south, and using that as the control, as, as the variable that you're actually testing. So the, 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 um, the, it's tested, two different types of things, two things are tested. 
One is uh, you know, daylighting is actually tested in a, a full-scale uh, mock-up, but then also um, thermal exchange is tested by a series of monitors that can be placed throughout the space and outside the glass, uh, on, on the outside of the glass, inside the glass, and so, on. You, so you can begin to understand the gradient of thermal flow throughout the space. And one thing that's very unique about come back. One thing that's very unique about this lab, and that there aren't many of, many of these in the U.S. Um, at all, is with thermal exchange, you can't, you can't scale down a model. You can't use a microwave-sized model and expect that to work. And many of, you, many of you in engineering probably know this even better than I do, but thermal, thermal flow works very differently as you scale it down. So the, the, um, the amount of heat and uh, the amount of heat moving on the inside of the glass does not scale down proportionally. So for daylight studies, you can do that. You can mock up a very small model, and then, and then you can interpolate or you can project that that would work on a larger scale. But for thermal factors, you can't do that. So that was one thing that was very unique and, and why um, Dr. Werner Long, who uh, was the professor who actually built this first lab, what he was very insistent upon is keeping it at a, the size of an office. Of, um, and one, one of uh, a student, Stefan, Bot Stefan Botter, to, uh, for his thesis project, decided to try to uh, design a, a, an innovative shading structure uh, based on the traditional paradigms of what shading, de what shading devices are in terms of horizontal louvers and vertical louvers and egg crate structures. He analyzed all those digitally uh, in, in simulation, but then was interested in trying to innovate upon those. And so he, he, under, he had a very clear understanding in terms of how those operated. And his design objective was to try to optimize view um, while being sure to block solar gain during the warmer six months of the year. And so what he ended up with is he's working off of a, uh, a honeycomb uh, sort of structure, hexagonal structure, for three reasons. One was that it loosely mimics the motion of the sun, uh, the movement of the sun, uh, which is inherently quite efficient. Second is the, the triangulation, uh, which is quite structurally efficient, as, as Bucky Fuller would attest to. And Lastly, it's a stacking module that could work and that could be manipulated. So this was, this was um, derived very carefully in uh, Rhino with Grasshopper and, and then tested uh, virtually as, uh, originally before then being uh, built in the School of Architecture with the CNC router uh, using polypropylene and rivets, uh, poly, just using polypropylene just because it was uh, uh, less expensive than other materials. Uh, and then essentially installing that and then actually testing it. So here this diagram shows a bit of how the system is meant to optimize the, the views from seating and standing level with, large, with larger openings within that realm. And this is, a, this is a, um, shown installed. And, and the results did show that uh, it actually performed just as well as the vertical and horizontal blinds, but with better views. So, so it was... Uh, it, it was, it was, this, was, this was an exciting project to, to see. And, and one, now one of the difficulties now is that with only one lab, the, doing the experimental version and the control tests uh, have to be done at different times. And so the, the climate is obviously not identical uh, in, in two different weeks. So you have to uh, uh, adjust accordingly. And so there's, there are more margins for error with that. Um, and now we, now we have a second lab. We don't, we don't have the equipment in it yet, but uh, we do have the, the twin lab now to allow for that simultaneous comparative analysis so that you can say, okay, the condition with, with just the glass and no, no shading device at all versus the condition when you do have the shading device and you can actually compare in real time. And uh, just recently, uh, engineering student Greg Arcangeli has, has just uh, done an interesting study where he, Instead of looking at a particularly innovative shading structure, he actually wanted to do some more baseline tests and, and, and really study um, uh, both through simulation and then through physical validation uh, using standard blinds, but the different types of different types of standard blinds and also different positioning uh, of, of, of blinds. And uh, the fi findings primarily proved assumptions such as uh, just it, in any type of blind helps reduce the cooling load. In, uh, in, in a space, uh, but that, and, and then also, uh, so despite the color of the blinds or despite the shape or the angle that they're oriented, uh, and then also that the best performer were ex having blinds on the exterior, which makes sense because of what we know in terms of long wave and short wave radiation. But what was, one thing that was interesting is that the, ha having the blinds on the, the inside, which we know is to be the, the least desirable place to have blinds for the sake of thermal exchange or uh, heat gain. Um, actually did perform noticeably better than, than not having the, the blinds there because even though the heat has gotten into the space and gotten to those blinds, 
it, d it does prevent the other surfaces uh, that, uh, from their, uh, prevent their thermal mass from heating up and keeping the space um, hotter. So it, it, that, that was one finding that was interesting. Um, and another project that I've uh, worked on a bit here uh, is the Smart Building Initiative, which is a, a way of monitoring en energy in Sutton Hall, which is a 100-year-old building uh, completely, uh, well, next to the School of Architecture in the southwest part of campus. And the, the, um, the idea was twofold. One is that the UT has uh, doubled in square footage since 1977 uh, without needing to take energy from, from any other, uh, from any outside source. Uh, but the, the folks at facilities are telling us that now we need, there's not much more they can do in terms of uh, taking on more square footage. And we now need to start talking about conservation. And so what's interesting about that is that even within the School of Architecture, students that are studying sustainable design, supposedly, most students don't actually understand uh, how buildings consume energy and how they can make a difference, how their behavior can make a difference in terms of how buildings consume energy. So, uh, as, and, and in terms of the facilities, they only understand the way that buildings consume energy just basically in terms of breakdown of steam, electricity, and chilled water. Uh, so part of the exercise was to uh, working with the Smart E building company, who was an up-and-coming practice that was interested in, in using our building as a guinea pig, we, we hooked up every single, um, every single light and plug and HVC, HVAC as well to understand very, at a very granular level how the building was really consuming energy. Um, this is showing a bit of some surveys we had given out uh, to architecture students in terms of what they expected to be the uh, biggest consumers of, of energy. And as you can see, the answers are just completely across the board. There was almost no, no understanding whatsoever. So uh, what, what one thing we've done is, um, I'm going to pull out, is we've created a, a website which allows for, for real-time monitoring, assuming I'm online. Yeah, we are. We're, so it, the building tweets every now and then as well. But it, it essentially, we're showing in, in sort of total consumption what, what the building is consuming, and you can break it down. We can break it down to floor by floor at this actual second, how many, you know, uh, understanding how many watts are actually being consumed. That's what the computer lab is, and it's not surprisingly, that's always the biggest consumer. But we're also interested in actually this, you know, it's a bit tongue in cheek, but we're interested in trying to break this down um, into units that would make sense to someone. Because you know, a kilowatt hour is, and again, you would be the honest who would understand that more than most. But most don't understand that. And so we try to break it down into units that might begin to make sense. And then also, uh, we're installing monitors around the classroom so, so you can see with a spectrum of color whether or not that classroom is consuming more or less energy than it did at, that exact, at this exact time one year ago. And another component of that is we, we um, developed a smartphone app, um, which was al also meant to allow, um, allow people to, to not, not only through the, the website, but also through an app to understand this. And to, to be honest, this has been less successful because this requires, you have to check in, students have to, it, it all, it, it's such a high barrier for entry. The students have to check into rooms and check out of rooms to really make this work too well. But the idea was that it was meant to be a little bit, a little bit more like Facebook, where there would be a, a social component to it, and you would be able to understand uh, what your citizenship score is in terms of how much energy you consume in, in the building. Oh, okay, so uh, let's see. So uh, again, to, to conclude, uh, a, a lot of uh, as as we go forward, I, I, you know, I reiterate once again I, that you know form and, and function both are are compelling things. But really, light and energy are something something that architects will need to increasingly learn to take on, and 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 likewise, engineers will need to be willing to work with architects, uh, you know, very early in the in the process as well, and be part of that, engage that creative component of design as well. Um, and, and I think that's what it is really been the driver behind a lot of uh, Foster's work and. So lastly, once again, I also just wanted to mention that, again, I, I am teaching this class this semester. Um, email me if you would like to join this course. We'll, we'll meet uh, next Wednesday evening. And um, 
that's it. Thank you very much. We have a lot of time for questions. We'll, we'll pass this around. Hey, <laughs> how's it going? Um, I guess my question is regarding the, uh, the Saudi Arabia high-speed rail project, which you did with Bro Happel. Um, you mentioned that there were a lot of logistical issues um, regarding you know, getting 30 engineers and 30 architects mm -hmm. in the room. Of course, uh, they didn't break out in civil war, so I guess you're still alive, and that's, <laughs> that's a good thing. But could you maybe elaborate on the exact issues with, with that, or like what are the challenges associated with getting early collaboration to start? Sure. Um, I think, in, I think I'll, I'll dispense with generalities and, and speak a bit about a couple of instances that might, might help with that. So uh, one example would be when, when it came to the structural design and it came to, uh, to actually determining how, uh, how the floor plates would be structurally supported. Um, we, we, at a fairly early stage, arrived at a solution that technically worked. It, it, it worked. In the eyes of the engineer, it was worked, and it was done. Check the box. It's, it's done. And, and, and we, we, we saw it as a much more open-ended question, as though this was something that, yes, okay, it, do, it does work right now, but it's something that we need to investigate a lot more, because we're not sure how, how, if, if that proportionally is going to feel right in the space, depending upon how everything else is fit out, as an, as an example. And so that, that's one, one, one way was that it, the, the expectations in terms of when something is complete was a little different. The architect's... Sometimes we like to ask questions as much as we like to give answers. And, and so that was one thing. And, and another thing that's a little more just uh, uh, log logistical, the more basic, is that engineers are very good at, at, at just working a regular schedule. They're very good at coming in and just working a nine to five job and coming in and just working that time. Architects are, are uh, uh, spread the day out a little bit more. And, and, and that's not to say architects work much harder. Maybe that's the case, but not, so I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that architects <laughs> tend to work longer hours. Maybe we're less efficient during that time. But that created a problem with just in terms of arranging meetings. We, we would have an idea late at night or very early in the morning, either, either way before the engineers, when the engineers went around, and, and, and it would hold us up a little bit. And it wasn't quite as efficient as that one-to-one -one development of simultaneously going forward all the time. And that was just something that we, did, we learned to get around. But it just became pretty clear. Like, that we assumed everyone would work past 6 p.m., and we'd go, you know, we, the only, so I said we work in the same room. The only thing dividing us was just a core of, of bathrooms, so we couldn't physically see them around the core. But we would come around at 6.02, and they'd all, all the engineers would be gone, and we couldn't, we couldn't believe it. But they, they, they did get their work done whenever their work was laid out for them. It's just they, they just expected us to be proposing those questions to them, so. Well, you know what they say about engineers? They're folks that are good with numbers but just can't stand the excitement of encounters lifestyle. <laughs> Sure. Um, my question, I'm, I'm actually a student in the, in the public policy school, so my question um, is more toward what elements of this are, um, do, you, do you see merit inclusion in not voluntary codes but mandatory codes? Um, like something, something along the lines of ASHRAE or IGCC, what elements of energy and light do you see as immediately relevant in ensuing iterations of mandatory code? So are you asking if I, if I think we should have more regulation? Is that, is that the general question? No, or? like um, my question is about um, where you see mandatory code going, what elements mm -hmm. of energy and light that you're working on okay. and, and very much like cutting edge, very forward thinking, sure. do you think will trickle down into okay. code next? Yeah, I'll, I'll, okay, so I have an answer for that that um, might seem a bit uh, radical, but I, I, I think that as the human population grows, as, as cities become more and more dense, we're becoming more and more urbanized, I think that light will increasingly become more valuable than property. So. In, in London, I was working on the design of a skyscraper for a, a couple of years, and one very important thing we had to consider were the, the rights to light and the rights to, uh, so there's, there's two things, I can't remember what they were. One, one's called right to light, and maybe it's right to sky or something, something like that, that, that all buildings have. But you can purchase that right from the neighbors. So if your tower is gonna overshadow 
the, the neighbor all the time, that's fine if you pay them off. You're buying that right to light. So if you take that to its logical end, and if you imagine uh, in one of the Coruscant, I believe is one of the name of one of these fictional cities in one of the Star Wars novels. It's a city that's it's a sphere that's completely a, 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 a planet that's completely built out, just all downtown. The entire the entire planet is a city. If you if you imagine, I mean, it certainly won't become that. But if you if you imagine going that direction, I think it will become very interesting when uh, daylight and right to light becomes very important. So uh, there are so uh, the, in addition to what I was mentioning in London, I, th I think I think that that's could be the way we're going if we continue to urbanize. Uh, but other than that, uh, I, I, I do expect that we will just generally have more regulation going forward into, as the standards keep increasing. In, in Germany, they're uh, far ahead of us in terms of their standards. They're expected the passive house standard in, in, in Germany is far ahead of where we are. And so already, when, when you renovate, even just renovate a house in Germany, they they test the, the, uh, the air tightness of the structure immediately, and it's, it's, they have very tight rhythms. So I think that in general, that have, but, but in terms of just this very kind of radical progressive thing, I think that it will be interesting to see what happens in terms of everyone fighting for light. It's more important to have access to light than it is to have actual, an actual uh, land. I was wondering if you could expand a little bit on your project with the Smithsonian in DC. Yeah, um, the the project for the Smithsonian in DC was uh, a museum of African American history, and we were shortlisted as the five finalist firms for that, with Diller and Scafidio and Antoine Predock, David Adjay, and I M Pei. And uh, we we actually. Uh, the, the, the site was incredible. The site, the site was actually in, in the corner of, uh, of the um, Monument Gardens, of Washington Monument Gardens. And so it's on axis almost with the, the White House and the Capitol. And our, our scheme was very much based on trying to be deferential to, uh, to the monument and to the other buildings in the mall. So our, our scheme was actually partially submerged and created a bit of a... Uh, I just say a bit of a sunken uh, courtyard because there's nothing on the mall that's very hospitable where you want to stop and sit and read it. it it's it's also formal. So in, instead of actually uh, creating one more building, which also would be a bit of a stone in the stream, we tried to be as subversive as possible and dig down. We ended up in that competition. We we were told we got second place. We didn't win. I know that we were told, but I imagine all the other four. We were all told we got second place because uh, there's no official second place. But that's an interesting, as a bit of a seminal point in, in my life, actually, because the idea was that if we had won that competition, I was supposed to move to D.C. to start the foster office there. And, and the same week, uh, I was hired to teach here. And so I didn't have to make that decision um, at all. But it would have been an interesting thing if we would have won that and things could have worked out differently. But I'm, I'm, I'm very happy where I am. In terms of, of light, do you use active elements as well with feedback and, and, and the like? It's a, it's a good question. Are, are, you, um, are, are you asking specifically about uh, when you say active, do you mean in terms of active operational uh, building elements? Or are you talking about real-time responsive? Uh, well, for... I would say yes and no. It depends on how you look at it. With with a thermal lab, uh, no, there, there, you know, it's it's all one directional. I suppose I, I, that'll be the answer to your question. So far, we've done only one directional. We're just we're testing and we're we're we're, we're receiving the information real time, but we're not manipulating it real time uh, to do so. We we have talked about uh, doing some some very uh, some interesting active moving facade elements where you would be able to actually calibrate, and which then later could be mechanized. But you could begin to tweak and test and understand how certain types of geometries perform for a shading device, for example. Uh, or, or perhaps, I don't know, maybe you're asking about chromatic glass, for example, which is an interesting innovation. 
and, and that uh, the chromatic glass obviously changes its properties to allow more or less light depending upon the sky condition. So currently we haven't done that, but I, I'm very interested in that, in that direction. Yes. So um, UT is now building its first chill beam. UT is now building its first chill beam construction building, um, which is a more common cooling strategy in more northern climates. Um, you know, it turns out that one of the most energy intensive um, activities in a building is distributing air, pumping air through conduits, you know, through plenum and, and other um, strategies to distribute chilled air. Mm -hmm. um, this strategy, you know, is, was worrisome in the beginning because the south wall of the building obviously might need more consideration than the, the north wall. Um, in your experience in London, did you, were you involved in chilled beam buildings uh, from the design standpoint or um, what, what's the common strategy? That's, that's a good question. I, I have not personally been involved in chilled beam strategies, but one thing that's becoming in, increasingly uh, more common, and I think is partially the future, are thermally active surfaces in general. So radiant, uh, radiant floors, for example. That's something that I, it, it, it works a bit better in uh, most European climates where you tend to not, it tends to not get as hot as it does here. Uh, but just in general, thermally active surfaces is, is something that I, I think will, you know, which is sometimes linked to geothermal and other, other strategies as, as well. Um, definitely has a, has a future in, in architecture, but in terms of chilled beams, I don't have any specific experience with that. Um, with the, uh, the project in Sutton Hall, I was wondering if you could give us any uh, preliminary insights as far as statistics. Um, Conservation, what's worked, buy-in, any anything like that. Okay, um, we're we're st to to be. I, I wish I had a better answer for that. We we we're we're still in the phase of trying to pull together all this information and trying to really make sense of it. it, it we we spent really the majority of of the the year putting it together of, of installing all the monitors and starting to find ways to to collect all the data and then to set up the website that is linked to that. So it's a bit premature to really say. One thing that we are starting to realize is that there's less that any one individual can do. It's different than in a house where you have appliances and depending upon when you wash and dry your clothes can make a big difference in your energy load and when you wash your dishes or controlling the thermostat. But you don't have any of those handles, any of those triggers in this building. All you have is plug load and light load. And, and the problem with the light load is that it's, the, the, and, well, it's kind of all or nothing with the lights. It's, 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 and so maybe, maybe that's pointing to one of the problems. But wh where we do see a lot of a potential benefit is in the, on the administrative side. So during the summer, for example, the building is, is, is probably less than a quarter used. So if we can be intelligent about understanding which rooms consume the most energy during the summer and just shutting down, because there are four different HVAC systems, four different zones, if you can shut down a couple of the zones, you could save just many, many thousands over the summer. So, so we're seeing more potential benefit on the administrative side in this particular case. And so the, it's a, a bit of a disappointing conclusion to realize that there isn't that much the individual could do to, to decrease consumption. But uh, it's a good question. I was just going to ask, you had a uh, bar chart up there of like the distribution of uh, energy consumption in a building that you just kind of skimmed past, and I was wondering if I could look at that again because I missed the numbers. I was trying to figure out what it was. What is it? Um, this it was, one? Yeah, or? that one. This one I'm on right now? Yeah, my eyes are not so good from back here. I was just wondering, so what are the blue, yellow, and black oh, symbolize? Uh, uh, um, it, it's chilled water and... Uh, Okay, so steam is gray, electricity is yellow, and chilled water is blue. And these are for, are these for industrial buildings, residential? This is Sutton, Sutton Hall, okay. Battle Hall, and the North Office Building. Okay. These, these are buildings in, uh, right next to the architecture building. 
And what would this look like for like a residential building? It's a, it's a good question. I, I actually don't know exactly what, what, it, what it would look like. I, um, I, I, w I was surprised to see, I, I expected, within Sutton Hall, for example, I expected electricity to, to be a, a lot, a, a much bigger consumption, particularly in the way that those classrooms are used, particularly for design studios, where there are you know, laptops plugged in, hundreds of laptops plugged in all the time, and the computer lab, which has hundreds of other laptops all plugged in, the servers. I expected the electricity to be a huge factor. So, um, but I, I, it's, it's a good question, and, and maybe even someone else here would have a better sense of how that, that, that breakdown would be. Yeah. Well, I, I could tell you that you, for residential, Hall, which is a chemistry building, has a hundred percent outside air because you don't want to be recycling, you know, air where wet chemistry is going on. So a full load of air comes in, is cooled, goes through the building, and is exhausted. And um, so the energy consumption of chilled water and fan pump energy in a building like that is enormous. Whereas it's much less than that in an office building or in a classroom building. Let's thank our speaker again. We are out of time. We have to end. Thank you very much.